Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight. It is just a blessing that you have allowed us to come into your homes and your workplaces on tonight. Would you please click the share button and start a watch party with your family and friends? There is a quote that says, Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. I'm going to say that again. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Thank God that when we sin and disobey God, he doesn't just kill us off right then and there. Our God is a good God. He is a great God. He is a compassionate, a compassionate God. He waits for us with open arms to come back to him. So when God tells us to do something and we don't want to do it, please know that you cannot run away from the presence of God. You cannot deceive God. God knows us and he can read us like an open book with large print, according to Priscilla, Priscilla Shriver in her book entitled Jonah, Navigating a Life Interrupted. So let us get busy doing what God has called us to do. After all, God created us. He owns us and we owe him our lives. Our scripture comes from Isaiah 30 and 18. That's Isaiah 30 and 18. And it says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. Again, Isaiah 30 and 18. The Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. Thank God for his great compassion on us. And I pray that God will give each and every one of us our yearning to read and study his word and to know him in a more intimate way. Because our God, we want to acknowledge that God is a great God. He's a good God. He can do anything but fail. He's moved so many mountains out of our way. God is a good God. So many mountains out 
Father God in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come. Lord, we thank you for another privilege. We thank you for another opportunity, another chance to come before you. Lord, we confess that you are the good God. And we, Lord, we know that you can do anything but fail. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for keeping us and blessing us. We thank you for just being good and being God all by yourself. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come before you to study your word, that your word will go forth, Father God, that men, women, boys, and girls will hear your word and make a change and turn toward you, that your life, Father God, in them will exemplify who Christ is. And, Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, anointed, and powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. He is the wonderful God. God is such a great God. He is a good God. He is a God who never fails. Thank you again for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. Tonight we're in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13, 14, and 15. It's where we are tonight. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 13, 14, and 15. Let me thank our visitors for joining us tonight. Thank you who are members of the New Beginning Church for being a part of our service. Thank you for being a part of your church service. Amen. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, verses 13, 14, and 15 is where we are tonight. We've been talking about legalism. Legalism is that thing that holds you bondage. Legalism is something that's a tradition. Legalism is something that you have grown accustomed to. And Paul points out here in chapter 2, beginning at verse number 11, he points out the fact that these new thought Christians, these, these new converts in the church at Colossae was being bombarded by Gnostics, and also bombarded by the Jewish rituals. These Jewish rituals became legalism. And these Jewish rituals became a burden to them. We all know that the law we could not follow. We all know that the law held us bondage. The law, before the Jesus Christ entrance on the scene, the law held mankind bondage. The reason why the law was bondage, because the law is a taskmaster. The law is one that held us to accountability, but at the same time, it created a lot of rituals. And those rituals are what we're going to talk about tonight. Last week, we talked about two of those rituals that they believed at that time, both saved mankind, and kept mankind saved. Listen to what I'm saying. They first of all believed that these rituals were necessary for salvation. Then they thought these rituals were necessary for sanctification. Paul says to them, these things we do, these things we ought to do, but these things does not give us salvation Neither does it give us sanctification. Let's look at the two that he pointed out on last week that we talked about on last week. He talked about verses 11 through 12. He talked about circumcision and he talked about baptism. We uh, identified last week that circumcision that was done by the Jewish rites or by the Jewish rituals, these circumcisions were the cutting away of a physical foreskin. And they believed that this circumcision put them in right standings with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
let me just point out some things how how the Jewish rites differ from the Christianity that we know now today. First of all, circumcision. In the Jewish rites, circumcision was a physical external surgery. It was a bloody external surgery. Circumcision was an external physical surgery. In Christianity, circumcision is an internal surgery. It is a spiritual internal surgery. It is a surgery that God does on the heart. So the physical surgery that the Jews did during biblical times was an external physical surgery. But when Jesus came along, the Apostle Paul preached after Jesus left, and he taught the church at Corinth that Christianity deals with an internal taking place, an internal happening, an internal spiritual surgery of the heart. Let me tell you, if you're born again, you're not born again because of circumcision, you are born again because God has had surgery. The Holy Spirit has entered into your heart. Your spiritual heart is a spiritual thing. The God that we serve has taken an internal approach. He has given us a spiritual surgery, and this surgery is of the heart. So the first thing we notice the difference in the Jewish rites, and when I say rites, I'm, I'm spelling rites, R-I-T-E-S, or the rituals. The Jewish rituals had an internal surgery that took place. I mean, excuse me, an external surgery that took place. It was a physical external surgery. In Christianity, we are circumcised in the heart. It is an internal Spiritual internal surgery. There's a difference. The second thing I want to point out in circumcision, when we deal with circumcision, and when in the Jewish rites or the Jewish ritual was circumcision on part of the body. It was a circumcision that took place on a part of the body. One single part of the body. And they believed that this circumcision of the part of the body identified you with God. In Christianity, there is a holistic or a, a whole, the whole part of the body is involved. The whole part of the internal body. And this circumcision is one that deals with our sins. When we are circumcised by God, by the Holy Spirit, when we are saved, when we are born again, God has forgiven us. It is a spiritual thing, and it deals with the whole of the man. That's why Paul says in Corinthians to the church at Corinth, he says to them, when a man is a new creature, things pass away. When a man, he says in the book of Romans, that we must be transformed by the, by the renewing of our minds because the whole body, the whole man, the whole attitude of the man changes when you're saved. The reason why we have issues with people who say that they're saved and we wonder if they're saved is because there's no change. When there's an internal change, there's an external change. You ought not be doing and saying the same things wrong that you did and said last year. You got to forgive some things. God has forgiven you. And you got to forgive them. If you're going to be victorious in this life, you must be forgiving. And you have to walk away from it. Don't try to get even. Don't let it torture you. Because when you are unforgiving... You hold yourself hostage. When you're not forgiving, you are holding yourself hostage. See, people must understand when you're not forgiving, 
You put a person in prison, but you got to stay there and watch them. <laughs> you cannot accomplish anything. And if you have a relationship that has gone bad and you have not forgiven, whether it's a friend, a family member, or an associate, or a, a person that you used to like, a person you were engaged to, a person you were married to, a person you were dating, if you are not forgiving, the reason why your relationships are being blown away today is because you have not forgiven the last person. And the devil knows how to pack you down with unforgiveness. The devil knows how to burden you. And you're wondering why nothing is going right. You're wondering why your attitude is bad toward other people. It's because you have not been forgiving. When you're circumcised in your heart, forgiveness takes over. When you're circumcised in your heart, you don't pack that stuff around. When God saves us spiritually, we are able to forgive and move forward. And as long as we are not forgiving, then we can't move forward. The other thing that we must understand, God, 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 when God saves us and God forgives us, we have to forgive others as God has forgiven us. And as we move forward, then we don't have to unpack some things. We don't have to drag things with us. We're able to move with ease. If your last relationship was messed up, you need to forgive and move on. Don't try to make them confess that they were wrong. Just forgive and move on. Spouses. If you go to sleep at night and you don't have forgiveness in your heart with each other, you're going to wake up with the same burden in the morning or a heavy burden, a heavier burden. So when circumcision takes place in Christianity, what we're saying is, is that you are changed. The whole of you are changed. The whole of you is changed. Everything about you are changed, is a change. The third thing I want to point out when we talk about circumcision, circumcision in the Jewish ritual was done by hands. Look at what it says in the text. In the text, Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, it points out the fact that we've been circumcised, those who are spiritual, those of us who are spiritual, we've been circumcised, and the circumcision was not with hands. So when we look at circumcision in, from a Christianity standpoint, we understand that it was done without hands. Circumcision in the Jewish ritual was done by hands. Circumcision in, the Christi in Christianity was done without hands. My next point, my next point concern, concerning circumcision. Circumcision in the Jewish ritual has no power to conquer sin. <clears throat> Circumcision, by way of the Jewish ritual, has no power. It's just a physical act. Paul points this out to the, the church at Colossae. He says that this is just a physical act where there's a cutting away of skin. It is a physical act, and it has no conquering power when it comes to sin. Sin is not conquered through the physical circumcision. But when, when you are circumcised in the heart by the Holy Spirit, you are able to overcome sin. You are able to put sin behind you. You are able to move forward. You're able to leave sin alone. Let me tell you, our sin nature is still there. Jesus has conquered sin. He has blessed us. We have been delivered from sin. But our sin nature still abounds. And sin nature tells us what we like. And it tells us to do what we like. I want to say to you today, don't keep walking backwards. Don't keep dibbling and dabbling in the same sin. And certainly don't pick up you any new sin. <laughs> Let me just share, the, share with you tonight 
we've been circumcised in our hearts. We've been circumcised in a spiritual manner. We've been circumcised in a way that was circumcision by way of the Holy Spirit. We've been circumcised in a way that was not with hand. We've been circumcised by the Holy Spirit. The next thing that Paul points out in Colossians chapter 12, he points out baptism. And people during that day believed, similarly to some people that believe this day, that baptism saves them. Well, and some believe not only do baptism save you, but they believe if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Paul points out that there is a parallel drawn with baptism and salvation, but it's not salvation through baptism. There is a parallel, and the parallel is that there is an outward expression of an internal change. Baptism identifies us with Christ. It identifies me to other people with Jesus Christ. It identifies me with Jesus Christ. In other words, as I told you last week, what happens is when you stand in the water, you're saying, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. The preacher, the deacon, the person who's baptizing you, the baptizer says, by the profession of your faith, or the confession of your faith, by the profession of your faith, I do baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Or I do baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Or I do baptize you in the name of Jesus. Any of the three, you see there's been a new thought that's come along that says, if you're not baptized in the name of Jesus, then you're not truly baptized? Let me share with you. First of all, when you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're being baptized in the name of Jesus. Secondly, when you're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're being baptized in the name of Jesus. So, many believe that if, if the teacher, preacher, the baptizer doesn't call out the name of Jesus, you're not baptized. But who is the son? That's right. The son is Jesus. That's right. And you believe that when you stand in the water, you're saying, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. <clears throat> when they bend you back in the water and you go under the watery grave, that says you believe that Jesus died and was buried in a borrowed tomb. When they bring you back up out of the watery grave, that says to those of us who are watching that I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. So it is an outward expression of an inward change, of an inward motivation, of an inward difference. It is an outward expression. So the question becomes, well, if I'm saved, if I confess Christ as my Savior and I die before I get baptized, <clears throat> then am I saved? You are saved upon the profession of your faith. You are saved upon the, you trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. Because a lot of people back home in the country would be going to hell if that was faith, if that was so. If that was their faith, because back home, you know, we had pastors that came around first and third and second and fourth. And then what they would do in the month of August, when it's, when it's hot outside, they would baptize once a year. Oh, now, what if I got saved on the morning bench in May, <laughs> morning bench, got saved uh, uh, sitting on the morning bench. I confess Christ as my Savior in May, and I died between May and August. Mm -hmm. I still have the right. I still have an entrance into heaven. I still am welcomed into heaven by Jesus Christ because my salvation took place in May. Yes, we ought to go get baptized. Yes, we ought to do it. Jesus said to fulfill righteousness, but... Salvation does not save us. 
The only reason why we are saved is not because of what we do in the water. We are saved because of what Jesus did on Calvary. And we're going to talk about that tonight. So baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. I'm saying to the people that when I get there, I'm standing in the water. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. When they lean me back and take me under the watery grave, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and they buried him under the ground. And when they bring me back up, they said, they said when, you bring, when, you, when you're brought back up, that says to all of us that you believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And that's why, and that's when the saints of God begin to shout because that means that you have been dead and buried with Christ and raised to a brand new life. So you hear shouting going on, people celebrating. The devil thought he had another soul, but no, he didn't. Because you're just saying to us, this is what I believe, and I'm going to show you my belief. So you get baptized. We were raised, he says in verse number 12, this is the working of God. This word working is another word for power. And this word power here, it, it means energy. So what he's saying is the same energy, the same power that raised up a dead Jesus <laughs> has also raised me up. He says, he says that the, the same working of God Faith in the working of God. I am raised with him. So we are raised with Jesus. This, this word working means that we are, we are co-laboring. We are we co-raising. We, we are being raised along with Jesus. It is symbolic to the fact that we believe that Jesus really got up. You know, some people believe that Jesus really didn't get up. Others believe that he wasn't really dead. I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus was dead all the way dead. Yes. For three days, he was dead. But as he promised, early that third day morning, he got up with all power. All power in heaven and earth. Let's look at verse number 13. Colossians chapter 2. It says, and you being dead in your trespasses. He's talking about before we got saved. He's talking about before we got to know Jesus. He says, and you being dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. You see, we were dead in our trespasses. And, and who raised us from the dead and... You being dead in your trespasses. You were dead in your sins. This word trespass is the same word. We get the word when we invade on somebody's property. We invade, we go too far. We are there without the right to be there. So we are trespassing. We are falling short. We are messing up. We are trespassing. In other words, we are sinning. We are missing the mark. And who and and he and and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you were uncircumcised in your flesh. You were uncircumcised in your hearts. You were dead in your trespasses. You were in your trespasses and you were dead on arrival. You were in your sin and you were stuck there. You couldn't get out. But Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection enables us to get out. <clears throat> and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive with him. Remember, we are co-laborers with Jesus Christ. Jesus has made us alive as he's now alive. He has made us alive with him. He has made us alive. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection paid the cost once and for all. He paid the cost one time and for all of us. We are raised with him. We now have life. It says and we are alive together. After Jesus got up from the dead, he was raised to life. He was living once again. 
And I want to tell you, not only was he living after he got up, he lives today. Matter of fact, I testify that he lives within me. The reason why you don't do the things you used to do, say the things the way you used to say them, do the things or say things the way you used to say it is because of Jesus living in you. Because I know some of you, you know how to shake your head, roll your neck. You know how to put them. Sometimes it's not what you say, but how you say it. And I know some of you know how to say it. You really, really know how to say it. So he says, he says, and, and you being dead, we were once dead in our trespasses and in the uncircumcision of our flesh. He has made a lie together with him. Having forgiven you of all your trespasses. Having forgiven you all your trespasses. King James would say, having forgiven you of all your debt, all of your trespassing, God forgave you for it. He, he, he has delivered you from it. Jesus did a great thing for us. He did for us what angels couldn't do. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He has now made us alive. We are made alive through him because in him dwells the fullness of God. There is none like him. Amen. The application is pretty clear. God forgave us all our trespasses so that we have a perfect standing before God. We have a perfect standing before God. Not that we are perfect, but we have a perfect standing. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says that now we have been imputed righteousness. It has been credited to our account as righteousness. We are not righteous, but it has been credited to our account that we are righteous. Only Jesus can do it for us. Yes. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross set us up pretty. He now, God now, sees us as righteous. God now sees us as perfect. This word perfect, in the original Greek, is not the word perfect that we know today. Oh, you're not perfect. None of us are perfect, but this word perfect comes from the same word. We get the word integrity. We now walk in integrity. We now walk upright before God. And we can't do it on our own. We have to trust Jesus to do it for us. Let's look further. Colossians chapter 2. Verses 13, and look at verse 14. And having wiped away the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Ooh, he said a lot right there. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, this word handwriting, this word handwriting, in some texts you will find the word written code. This written code that he talks about is, is the law. We couldn't keep the law. This new life came when God forgave us of all our sins. For he concealed the written code. Before God's written law, his written code, people stood condemned. This written code was a law, and people stood condemned because they could not keep the law. And guess what? Today, we cannot keep the law. Doesn't matter how holy you are. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how long you've been in church. You cannot to keep the law. The law was a taskmaster. The law was a schoolmaster. The law held us in bondage and held us bound. Thank God for Jesus because Jesus ushered in grace. Yes. Jesus ushered in mercy. That's why it's not Christian to stone people to death. Before Jesus, they would stone you to death for what you did. 
You stole, they cut your hand off. We won't steal with that hand anymore. You lied, pluck your tongue out. You commit adultery, they stone you to death. Well, it'll be a few people on planet Earth, but we would be righteous people. So we couldn't keep the law. Jesus ushers in grace. He gives us mercy. And now when we sin, we just confess our sin, repent of our sin, turn away from our sin, and we move forward in the name of Jesus. That's why we can't make fun of other people. Yes, right. That's why we can't condemn other people. We have to walk with other people through their dirt. Mm -hmm. Because it was just yesterday that God saved us from our dirt. You have to live in the midst yes. of other folk. Mm -hmm. See, we, we as Christians come to the point where we believe that our sin, because our sin is different, we're special. You notice I say our sin is different because we got sin. We all sin. We have sin. But because our sin is different, we want to put other folk on blast. We want to throw shade at them. But let me just share with you. God does not honor sin. Your sin, not my sin. Therefore, we all have to confess it. We have to go to God and say, Lord, I messed up again. And call that sin out. Tell God what you did. He already know what you did. So stop trying. <laughs> stop trying to hide it from him. Confess it to God. Give it to God. Give your sin to God. And confess it. Verse 14. He says. Having wiped away the handwriting of requirements. That was against us. This law was against us. We couldn't keep up with it. We couldn't live it out. Which, which, which was contrary to us. It was, it was contrary. It was bad. It was really bad. Against, it was against us. It's kind of like the laws that we have on our books today. Not only are the laws written so we cannot secede, it is really written against us. And now it's being enforced like never before. There are people who are entitled and they have a sense of entitlement, but they don't understand that God is yet sitting on the throne. He's looking at us and just because they have a different shade, <laughs> they're sinners too. God is not sleep. <clears throat> Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I know the night is long. I know times are hard. I know structure is bad. I know anarchy is on the scene. I know that we're in the middle of a civil war right now. But God is not asleep. God is in love with those who are being oppressed. God is not asleep. Look at what it says. Colossians chapter, chapter 2 verse 14 he says this law was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, mm -hmm. having nailed it to the cross. Right. Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit has nailed it to the cross. He has nailed this law to the cross, whereas it was a written code. Now we have mercy. Now we have grace because Jesus allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. He was nailed to the cross on our behalf. He was nailed to the cross so that we would be redeemed. <clears throat> now we've been, it's been, that sin, that sin been nailed to the cross. Now that written code, we walk by grace. We walk by mercy because the law was against us and it was really contrary to us. That's what it says in the text. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand that we're not good enough. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in church. It doesn't matter how many times you pray. It doesn't matter how many, how many Hail Marys you do. It doesn't matter how many bees you count. Let me just share with you, Jesus is the only thing and the only person who makes us righteous. 
We are only righteous because of what he has done, not because of what we do. We're only righteous because of him. Jesus has wiped it away. Jesus has disarmed the demonic powers and the authorities that once triumphed over us. Let's look at verse 15. It'll tell you there. It says, this Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, having disarmed, and I'm reading New King James, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Jesus disarmed all principalities and all powers. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that there's a war going on. Paul says, and this war is not a flesh and blood war. This war is in the heavenlies. It's in the, in the heavenly realm. This war that's going on cannot be won by flesh and blood. But Paul says here, Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says Jesus Christ has disarmed it. Those powers, those principalities that once held us back, we were captivated by sin. Jesus has disarmed it. Jesus has set us free. Jesus has made a way for us. He has given us a new covenant. He has set us free. He has made us righteous. He has made a change in our lives. And it's not because we have so much faith, but it's only because of the faith God has given us in our trust in Jesus Christ. No one at all, no thing at all could have made us whole. I told you this circumcision makes us whole. It's of the whole. It's not a part. The spiritual Christian circumcision of the heart makes us whole. It deals with the holistic man. It makes us different. And it wasn't because of what we've done. So stop bragging about who you are. Stop bragging about how saved you are because all of us are saved the same, to the same level. Stop bragging about your sanctification because Jesus Christ is the one that makes us sanctified. Yes. We, can't, we can't even keep ourselves under control. Matter of fact, when it comes to sin, especially sin that we like, sin that we used to do, and when it comes to holding our sin nature down, we can't do it. It's because of Jesus being alive. Verses 13 and 14 says he's alive in us. And because he's alive in us, that's why we walk away. Yes. That's why the Chronicle writer says like this, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, stop acting like you have accomplished. Only Jesus has accomplished. Yes. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, get down off your high horse. The word humble in the, in the Hebrew term means to place yourself beneath. It is the same word we get the word submarine, means to go under. So as Christians, we must humble ourselves, submit ourselves, go under. We have to go under the, the authority of Jesus Christ, go under God's word, go under the leadership that's over us. We have to place ourselves under. And it's a voluntarily, it's a voluntary thing. <laughs> we do it voluntarily. It's a voluntary occurrence. We have to humble ourselves, go beneath the holy writ of God. Verse 15, Colossians chapter 2. Having disarmed, Jesus has disarmed the principalities. And he's disarmed the powers. He has made a public spectacle of them. Jesus Christ has made a public spectacle of them. I told you earlier, he has nailed it to the cross. 
Not only were our personal sins forgiven at the cross, but those rules, remember the rituals? Those rules that condemned us have also been removed by the death of Jesus Christ. The death, the birth, the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ nailed it to the cross. It's delivered us from the principalities. In lieu of Satan being a fallen angel, Satan wants us to think that he has the victory. Satan wants us to think that he has been victorious. But the fact is, Jesus Christ has gained the victory for us on the cross. He has gained the victory for us, and he has opposed the devil. He has set us free. Paul says he has made a public spectacle. This is a military triumphant term. He has made a public spectacle when prisoners of war were stripped and paraded before the public, they were made a public spectacle. Let me just share with you. The devil and his imps have been made a public spectacle because they've been stripped of their power and they've been marched through the public streets to announce that they have no more power. The power allows, aligns with Jesus Christ. Wherever Jesus is, the power aligns with him. The power lies with Jesus Christ. The power is in Jesus Christ. The power for us to avoid sin is in Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. No angel could have separated us from our sins. It took Jesus on the cross. When he nailed it to the cross, he delivered us from the power of sin. I told you before, three things happen when we confess Christ as our Savior. Number one, he saves us from the penalty of sin. This penalty, he saves us from the death of going and abiding in hell from now on. So he saves us from the penalty of sin. We don't have to worry about sin. We have justification. We have salvation because Jesus Christ has nailed it to the cross. The second thing he did, he saved us from the power of sin. That's why we have sanctification. That's why we can live right. We don't have to sin. We don't have to obey our sin nature. We can live a righteous life. We can live a sanctified life. And you don't have to be a member of a sanctified church. All right. Because all churches ought to be sanctified. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have to be a member of a church that's called a sanctified church. Mm -hmm. You must be a sanctified, set aside holy being in order to live a sanctified life. Yes. And you can't do that on your own. You need Jesus for Jesus has already been victorious. He's already been triumphant and he's already made a public spectacle of the devil. Yes. He made a public spectacle of him. He, he said, look at, look at what he says. Having disarmed the principalities and power, he made a public spectacle of them. He made a public spectacle of the devil, a public spectacle of his imps, a public spectacle of the devil's principalities. He made a public spectacle of the devil's powers. He died on Calvary. He made a public spectacle where everybody can see it. And here we are 2,000 years made later and still talking about it. Right. We're still talking about it because it was one of the great, it is the greatest events of all time. It is the greatest event of all time. For the Houston Texans, when, uh, when uh, Deshaun Watson moved out of the pocket and he scrambled and got kicked in the eye and still got up when he was almost down and threw a, a touchdown and threw a strike in the end zone for a touchdown, that's one of the greatest plays that the, Tex the Texans will ever remember. But I want to tell you, Deshaun Watson's spectacular play does not top what Jesus did on Calvary. He was bad. I mean, Deshaun Watson, he's getting paid millions now because of that one play and several other plays. But the fact of the matter is Jesus made one move on Calvary, another move from the grave, and nothing compares to it. 
We still are talking about it 2,000 years later. Now, let me just share with you. Our grandchildren won't be talking about Deshaun Watson. Our grandchildren won't be talking about the, the, the blessed plays that we've seen over and on over from, from the Texan quarterback. But 2,000 years later, we're still talking about the man in the tree. When preachers go to seminary, they graduate with their degrees. When they get back to the church and start preaching, they still got to talk about the victory that came forth when a man gave his life on a tree. See, it doesn't matter how educated you are. You have to come to a point in your life where you understand that you are nobody without Jesus. You must understand that Jesus has given us the victory and we didn't take the victory for ourselves. Jesus made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them in it. Jesus was triumphant. He triumphed over it. He got the victory in it. And because of Jesus, now we have the victory. Yes. 2,000 years later, Paul says, while we were yet in our sins, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, while we were still in our sin, Jesus died for us. He set us free. He gave us power. He defeated the devil in his sins. And we have power now to live right, power to act right, power to talk right. You don't have to cuss like that. Jesus has given you power over cussing. You don't have to lie like that. Jesus has given you power over it. You don't have to gossip like that. Jesus has given you power over it. You don't even have to brag like that. You don't have to have pride that you have. Jesus has given you power over it. He was triumphant. He calls us to, to be triumphant. He, he calls us to be victorious because he did it. And here we are over 2,000 years later, still talking about it and how we celebrate him and what he did on Calvary and what he did when he got up from the tomb. I'm talking to somebody tonight. The door of the church is open. You need to confess Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you've never confessed him, I want to let you know that Jesus wants to give you power. He wants to make you triumphant. He wants to give you power to have victory over everything and everybody in your life. Everything that's trying to hold you back. Everybody that Jesus has died for you but he also got up for you. And there are some of us who have power and don't even, didn't even know we had power. For those of you who've never confessed Christ, you can have that power today. You tried it, you tried them, you tried her, you tried him. I recommend Jesus. You can get to know him right now. You can get to know him by confessing Christ as your savior. By inviting Jesus Christ into your life to be your, your Savior. Just repeat after me. Very simple prayer and invite Christ into your life. Will you bow your head with me? Just repeat after me and invite Christ in. Lord Jesus. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer and invited Jesus Christ into your life that you are born again. When you die, you're on your way to heaven. We believe that, that God has a way of blessing us and he's done that and he's willing to bless us through Jesus. For those of you who are saved and know that you are, 
but for some reason or the other, you're not walking uprightly. I recommend that you get reconnected, rededicated, renewed in Jesus Christ. If you want to get reconnected, renewed, just invite Jesus Christ to take over. Not only be your Savior, but be your Lord. He wants to Lord over your life. He wants to be your master. He wants to be with you when you're going through trying times. And we're going through a time in the great United States of America right now that you need Jesus. We know that the governor can't do it. The president can't do it. We know that the mayor can't do it. And we know Congress won't do it. But we know that Jesus can. We need Jesus in the midst of this chaotic time. And we need to walk with him and stay with him. So if you want to walk with Jesus, let me know. If you need prayer, let me know by inboxing me. If you made a commitment tonight to invite Christ into your life, inbox me and let me know. I'm so glad that you've joined us. I'm so glad that you've been a part of this service. And for those of you who don't have a church home or in between church homes, I recommend the New Beginning Church where you can join through live broadcast. You can join um, by internet. Just let me know, inbox me, and let me know that you want to be a part of the New Beginning Church, and we will welcome and celebrate you. We've had five people join the New Beginning Church and since we've been, been live, since we've been out of church building. You can do the same tonight. Inbox me, I'll send you a form, let you sign up, and, and uh, be a blessing to us and we can be a blessing to you. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Amen. <clears throat> Sister Howard says tonight that Symphony invited Jesus Christ into her life as her Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for we thank God for another privilege, another honor to get one of them out of the hands of the devil. Thank God. We rejoice with you, Symphony. We rejoice that you have come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight. For those of you who, who need a church home, just, just let me know, and I recommend the New Beginning Church. Thank you for joining us. It is now time to give to the Lord through tithes and offering. Hallelujah. Don't wait to Sunday. You can give today. You can give right now through tithes and offering. You can give to the New Beginning Church even right now uh, online. You can give you can give to the New Beginning Church. We have three ways that you can give. First of all, you can give by way of Cash App. You can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag, our cash tag is NBC Souls, dollar sign, NBC Souls, dollar sign, NBC Souls, NBC Souls. You can give uh, to the New Beginning Church by way of Cash App. Or you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea here is as we lift Jesus, Jesus draws all men to himself. Or you can mail your offering or your tithes in to New Beginning Church, P.O. Box 503. Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our 720 broadcast, our 720 p.m. on Wednesday night Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night by way of Zoom as well as by way of Facebook Live. We look forward to seeing you for Bible study every Sunday. At 9 a.m. every Sunday, these same places uh, for Bible study at 9 a.m. every Sunday. And please join us for a 1045 service, a 1045 worship service every Sunday also. Thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you. Look forward to hearing from you. Looking forward to you being a part of our service. Thank you so much for your giving on tonight. Please give tonight and don't wait to Sunday to give. Thank you so much for your giving.
We at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. Let me please remind you, regardless of how long the lines are, uh, there have been record turnouts all over the United States so far for those states that have voted. There have been record turnouts. Please be counted. Please be counted. Please go out and vote. Please go out and vote. Please go out and vote. Some people have been able to get in and vote within 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I stood for four hours and I stood there with a smile. The whole time I was standing there, I remember what my four parents had gone through and what they have endured. So I want you to go out and vote. Don't make any excuses. Go out and vote. Make sure your voice is heard. Make sure your right is exemplified. And make sure you take advantage of the privilege, the privilege that you have. They're still trying to strike it down even 50 years later. We need to make sure we go out and vote. Second thing I ask you to do is go and pray. <laughs> Always pray. Keep God first. Pray. Ask God to bless your decision and bless you as you as you go forth. Amen. Thank you so much for our prayer meeting. Our next prayer meeting will be by way of Zoom. Our prayer meeting will be by way of Zoom. Um, uh, second, uh, fourth, fourth uh, Tuesday. On second Tuesday, we have our prayer meeting by way of conference call. On fourth Tuesday, we have our prayer meeting by way of Zoom. So look forward to seeing you. Look forward to being a part of your life. Please remember, young people, uh, go ahead and send in your achievements, uh, your school achievements, your work achievements. Send them in to Sister Davis. Make sure you get those in so we can recognize you on this coming Sunday. This is third Sunday. We want to recognize our youth and our young people and all the great things that they have done. If we were at the church, we would have you come in and bring your, your um, report cards and put them in a box and we would pray for you. Even if you're not doing so well, I understand the situation that we're going through today with online, uh, with the online school. I understand the situation. If you're not doing so well, we want to lift you in prayer. Please do. Please, ma'am, please, sir, allow us to pray with you and pray for you. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to hear your word. We pray for our youth and our young people. We pray that you bless them, that you keep them focused, that you give them favor, that they will walk with you, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to bless them as they go before teachers and professors. We pray, Father God, that you give them wisdom. And we pray for mercy, Father God, that you, Father God, will intervene and you will make a difference. Now, Lord, we ask you to continue to bless our church, every member, every visitor, Father God, we pray that you cancel COVID-19. We pray that you cancel the coronavirus all over this world. Lord, we pray, Father God, that you get the attention of our leaders, that our leaders, Father God, will honor you with all they have, that our leaders, Father God, will see you in another dilemma and see that you're operating even in the midst of this dilemma, even in the midst of this situation, that they will see you on a different level that they will honor you as God, they will bless your name, and that they will be blessed from it. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and the only true God, unto him be power, be mercy, and glory. And our church said, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you, God keep you, is our prayer.